Hello and welcome to this episode 9 of Melt Season Updates for 2021. And uh, in this episode we will look at three new weeks of volume and also three new weeks of sea ice extent in the Arctic. So this is the volume view and we have 21 new days that you can see up here on the upper row and they are summarized per week down here and as you can see these are sort of safe safe melt values like green is below the average of the past decade and the yellows are just slightly above the average and since the last time uh, the the um, ever elusive blue ocean event has become even harder to reach so now it's uh, not only red level melt that's required but magenta level melt which is like twice the average melt and upwards and you see you don't even have one single day of red or magenta up here for the past three weeks uh, and of course then you don't have it down here in the weekly summaries either and for the last year 2020 you had you have one red day up here red level melt but as I said, not even the red level would get us to a Blue Ocean event or BOE or Virtual Ice Free in the late summer. Uh, so yeah, it's not not much to write home about with the volume. Um, it's uh, it's one of the lowest years, but you know for now it doesn't look like there's any hope or danger of a ice-free September. So let's look at the extent. So these are the three new weeks and all of them are green, so safe level melt. They are below the decade average for the week. Um, and you can also see up here, these are the three weeks, 21 days. And it's been kind of slowing down, you know, with this uh, very, very low melt uh, blue days. Uh, but the thing about the blue days is that they also occur in other very, very high melt years. And at this time of the year, they may actually indicate that the ice is sort of uh, kind of spreading out in a way, you know, thinning and spreading out and preparing for for bigger melts. We had that in 2020, as you see here, and also one day in 2012 before it started, you know, going up to yellow and red level. Um, so even here with the with the extent, uh, we need actually not only red level melt but the magenta level. So uh, we are very very far from uh, from being in danger of a blue ocean event. It's kind of interesting that you have a sort of a cliffhanger for the very very last day, which is yesterday. You have this one hundred and thirty thousand square kilometer melt for Wednesday uh, and it's red level so it's maybe you know turning over into a slightly uh, higher rate of melt you know higher than average even uh, and we've also seen that in the in the um, Central Arctic Basin uh, sea ice area stats for the latest days. So we may have sort of gone over uh, a cliff, but on you know only the regular cliff that you have every 
every day it's summer, right? So it's not sort of, it's not the civilization ending cliff. It's more like a, the modern decades ice melt cliff, which occurs every year. Um, so about that, for, uh, because it looks very, very unlikely that we're going to have a Blue Ocean event uh, in 2021. But uh, having said that, it's uh, kind of a done deal that we will see a Blue Ocean event in one of the closest one of the next years. Uh, it's like, how could we not? But just as 2021 appears to be a, an outlier with um, slower melt and less melt, uh, maybe not as warm in the Arctic as uh, other recent years, we suspect also that uh, the year that we finally go over to go over the edge to the um, Blue Ocean events will also be an outlier, but just a you know, a negative outlier with less ice, of course. Um, so these variations, these natural variations with some higher years and some lower years, that's what you're gonna have to expect when it comes to natural phenomena and also when it comes to the Arctic. Uh, so, you know, because we passed the tipping point for the sea ice uh, many decades ago, at least in my opinion, or uh, you know, to you know, from looking at data for the sea ice, it's pretty clear that it isn't collapsing for no reason. So, so when it go over the, over the tipping point, it doesn't really move very fast uh, immediately. It's like it it goes over and then it uh, just gradually disappears faster and faster. Uh, so when you finally hit the ground after going over the cliff, and you hit the ground in this case, when you have no CS left at the end of the season, that's not uh, because uh, that's a tipping point, that's because the tipping point was before and now you finally see the consequences of the tipping point, which is like hitting the ground hard. Okay. So in this week's uh, Climate Cope rant, we'll look at uh, the different uh, copes people have when you tell them that you have passed the tipping point. And uh, the first of these uh, copes is uh, there's not just one tipping point, but many tipping points. And that's like saying, okay, uh, never mind, we, we passed the first four or five tipping points like here. There are many coming later, and that's uh, supposed to be some kind of uh, uh, comfort <laughs> that these are going to crash later. Um, you know, these tipping points are lined up like dominoes in the cascade, and tipping one or four or five uh, dominoes first will also secure the later tipping of the others and but you know still these people cling to the hope that oh there are still some tipping points that haven't been crossed I and mean, that are much much bigger like the east antarctic and stuff uh, so okay well whatever whatever gets you through the night and uh, the second coping mechanism is uh, to say that no, we didn't pass the tipping point. The the ice is just flowing like crazy for no reason. Uh, and I was like, okay, it tells me more about your inner life and your feelings, in a way, than what's actually happening on the ground. And uh, a third way of reacting or coping to the tipping point message is that is to say that we, we cross some tipping points, but they're not irreversible. So it's like they have a private definition of a tipping point, a definition that doesn't include the, the word irreversible, which, uh, as it happens, is 
a key part of the definition of a climate tipping point. It is that it's gone too far, it's uh, beyond the point of no return, and it's not reversible. So, And the fourth um, cope is to say that we didn't cross any tipping points, because my feelings uh, and it's a variation of the others. Uh, you see it most often in the shape of no, we didn't pass the tipping point because that would mean you have to say we are effed or we should just do nothing or, or uh, we should just give up. So they have this uh, sort of complete narrative that they have from, I guess, TV or social media or from reading Michael Mann's book or something uh, and it prohibits them from actually realizing that you pass the tipping point because they believe that if you say A you know passing we have passed the tipping point then you have to say B C D E F G A L blah blah the rest of the alphabet uh, as some kind of it has to be this way. Uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, and in my opinion, anyway, you should be able to, you know, neutrally judge whether or not we have passed the ice tipping point and the RT tipping point and the CO2 tipping point and the ocean giving out CO2 instead of soaking it up tipping point and the Amazon and the soil starting to release CO2, these are things that are uh, objective properties of our planet and you shouldn't have to, you know, link that to different kinds of social reactions to the fact. You should be able to, you know, put on your scientific hat and say we either did pass these tipping points already or we didn't and then, you know, deal with the consequences later. The science doesn't, uh, you know, react to whether or not you feel good about it. But that's my opinion anyway. Uh, so apparently the uh, research team that uh, went to the North Pole and the Arctic Ocean uh, in a ship that uh, was intentionally frozen and drifting with the ice for over a year. Uh, they've returned half a year ago to Germany and uh, they've studied the long afterwork of analyzing all the data. And they've had a press conference uh, this summer um, where their uh, research director stated that we may have already crossed the tipping point for the Arctic uh, and uh, as a consequence global warming may be irreversible at this point. So that's, you know, kind of a late statement or, or it is not the first statement of this kind but, but it's like you can't really claim that somebody who has uh, had a huge team of many hundred scientists arctic and climate scientists being on a ship and on the ice for 12 months it's the biggest polar expedition ever in history you can't really claim that the their science director and their research director doesn't know what he's talking about you know clearly he knows a thing or two about the arctic and, uh, and the way he frames it at the press conference is that yes we most likely triggered this climate tipping point and because it's the big and early and important tipping point, it means that 
the global warming saga is now irreversible. It means it doesn't mean we, it's not possible to do anything. It means basically that the Arctic doesn't need any more input from industry, from, from human society. It doesn't require high emissions of CO2 anymore in order to keep melting and keep heating up further. Uh, that's sort of the definition, you know, in layman's terms. Um, of course, you could imagine things that we could uh, do in order to preserve the ice, you know, human uh, ingenuity, uh, human ability to come up with ideas. It is kind of endless, uh, but in many, many cases, <laughs> the suggestions, uh, when analyzed further, will actually make one or two or three things even worse than they are now. And just because you have an idea doesn't mean it's a, a super idea, okay? Um, but, yeah, so uh, it's important, I think, that uh, the, the first domino or the first tipping point is framed by uh, by this uh, research team in the way that global warming as a whole is now ir irreversible because we have like i've illustrated here we have set off the first of these kind of tiny uh, dominoes but because of the way dominoes work or because of the way a cascade of tipping points and points of no return uh, work, they will uh, create huge, massive effects, you know, further down the line. And it's really no comfort that there are massive, massive uh, ice masses in East Antarctica that still haven't tipped because, you know, the setup is that uh, the Arctic, the, 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 the sea ice in the Arctic and the Greenland melt and the heating of the ocean because of albedo changes, uh, all of these things will eventually uh, transport themselves down to uh, the Antarctica uh, and, and the West Antarctic ice sheet has already tipped uh, and you will see the same thing going even to East Antarctica and you will start losing ice like crazy in the entire South Pole area uh, as a consequence of tipping these first initial tipping points and setting off these dominoes. So you shouldn't sort of lean back and, and relax and say, look at all these other tipping points that we still haven't tipped over uh, <laughs> that should really make you even more worried or scared because you know that only means that these will collapse as well so yeah okay it looks like it's going if i understand course right it looks like this is going south it looks like it's going if I understand course right, it looks like this is going south. You may know him from his own YouTube channel, Going South, although he seems to be going north every time I talk to him. <laughs> his YouTube channel, Going South. Um, yes. You know, we had Jeremy. Yeah, Cogan, everything's who's... going south. Yeah, yeah, yeah everything sure. is going south. It's all going south, south right? Yeah. Right, so, it's going so, south, but that... It's not all or nothing. It doesn't mean that it goes south until everything completely vanishes. Yeah, but, but do you think right? which people... many people can easily say that yeah. you know it's all going south? There's absolutely okay. nothing we can do because the ice must flow. <laughs>